This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac Community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this time we have a special treat. We have a first-time Take Control author. We talk to a lot of Take Control authors, but everybody has to have a first time. This is Charles Edge's first time as a Take Control author and a first time on Mac Voices. Charles, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chuck. It's great to meet you as well, finally. Yeah, we've we've been corresponding back and forth. I've been watching your book get developed as chapters published through Tidbits, uh, of course, and kind of waiting. When can I get to talk to him? When can I get to talk to him? So, so finally, we're 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 good. Um, so let's let's start with a little background. This is your first Take Control book, but you're not a first time author. Nope, this is my ninth book, I believe. Um, but it is my first book that's not. Uh, geared towards the systems administrator. So in this case, um, while it is server that we're talking about, we're really gearing the book for home and small office users. So a much less technical crowd. And, and so you are very much a server guy then? I am very much a server guy, yeah. <laughs> good, good. Then, okay, well, that's good. It's, it's always a challenge, I think, for an author, really for anyone, even trying to teach the stuff, to take it from up here and pull it down to where the rest of us can approach it. So... Good job. We appreciate your efforts. Um, it, it's actually very synergistic, um, to use a terrible buzzword in the IT community. But um, but I, I, I'm also I, I've just recently switched positions, so I'm working with a much less technical crowd in my new position as well. So it's kind of nice to to have the same thing that I'm doing after work be the what I'm doing during work, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and and I can see how one would feed off the other uh, to to help. I mean, I'm sure there are times that you get frustrated with one or the other, and maybe it can bring two different perspectives to it. Totally. I've probably learned as much talking to Adam about the community that um, that the book is appealing to as I've uh, as I've learned at work, like going through this whole transition. So it's very it's 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 been really cool, and I I, I would say as helpful for me as it would be for anyone reading it, to be honest. <laughs> So thanks to the readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you little guinea pigs all right. out there all over the place. <laughs> well, of course, we are talking about take control of OS X server. In my experience, and, and I fit into one of these categories, I think everybody does. When somebody says the word server, the geeks kind of rub their hands and say, oh, boy, I can't wait. Um, the, th there's a faction that gets terrified, like, oh, my God, server. And then there are the other people who just do this blank look and say, okay, I've heard about it, but what can it do for me? Why do I need one? Why do I want one? And I, I've, I don't think we need to worry about the geeks too much because they already know what they're doing. But how about the people that are either terrified of this or just don't completely understand why they would want one because they've got a bunch of cloud services going and you know they may have, they've got file sharing at home on their Macs and that works just fine. Why do we need a server? So the, the server comes into play, um, I, I would say file sharing is the number one service used. And yes, you have a server at home and you're able to kind of share files between them. But when you end up needing more granular settings, for example, you have a Windows computer, you want to allow to access certain things but not others. Um, you have your kids, you, wanna, you want them to be able to submit their homework um, for you to review but not see each other's. Uh, that would be like home in a small classroom type of environment. Um, but file sharing is really only one of 10 or 15 services that run on that platform. Um, there's also Profile Manager, which allows, to continue on with the home user example, a parent to, uh, to manage the iPhones of their children or, um, or a small business to manage the iPads that they're sending out with employees and things like that. Um, there's a wiki service under the hood, so you can actually submit files through the wiki service a la kind of how you do with Dropbox, but also you can use that service to then have people just write content without actually making a new file. So it's very iPad friendly and things of that nature. Um, OS 10 server specifically is geared for Apple-based environments. It, it's 
very useful in some non-Apple environments, but it's very much tuned to the Apple environment. So when you're when you're looking at all the different things that you do on iPads and and Apple computers um, or Macs, then you know it, it kind of enables you to do more. For example, when that last update to uh, to iOS came out, um, then the there's a uh, software update service um, that would allow you to instead of downloading that to eight different devices, just download it once and then distribute it to eight different devices. So. Rewind for just a second. You said something about managing iPhones and iPads, and mm -hmm. that that sounds very interesting. If you're in a business, iPad deployment. If you're at home, iPhone deployment for the kids. Yep. What kind of things can you do from a management perspective? Um, anything that Apple exposes using they, they have an API API for this. So, um, for example, I want to force a passcode. Um, you know, that's more in a small business setting than at home a lot of times. Um, I want to block my devices from using Find My iPhone because um, in a small business setting, for example, if I have employee turnover, I don't want to brick those iPhones if they have Find My iPhone enabled. Um, you can send mail settings. So if you have, you know, the edgefamily.com as your home domain and you want your kids to be able to have those settings, but you don't want to have to tap in all those settings on every single device, because we all have 3.4 now on average, then it, it just enables you to do a lot of setup very quickly. Um, and then you can also lock various features from being able to be used, so you can um, turn off Game Center, things of that nature. Can we manage the apps that are installed, or they're allowed to be installed on those devices? In a business setting, yes. In a home setting, no. The volume purchasing program is for education and business only. So you can't actually get a, uh, a token to manage those devices and access to that portal unless you have a DUNS number or unless you have a, um, a, an educational environment where your SE hooks you up with one. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we will get back to you know why we would want one. But is this stuff really, at this point, easy enough for, for mere mortals? I mean, is it something that you're going to sit down and, okay, we're going to take the home user first. <clears throat> first. Can you do it in an evening or a couple hours? Um, I would answer that question on a service-by-service -service basis. I should make a spreadsheet and say, <laughs> oh, these are the services that you should tackle at home, and these are the services that you probably shouldn't. Um, Profile Manager is probably the most complicated, and that's the service that allows you to manage iOS devices and, and Macs um, at this point. Um, and I, I do think that a home user can, can grasp those concepts, um, but it, it might be a lot more work than, for example, someone who's got a, a pretty deep IT background. Having said that, a lot of people who I work with on Profile Manager with deep IT backgrounds don't really understand the Apple platform. So there's, there's definitely um, places where a home user might actually be a little ahead in certain regards. For example, they would know what Game Center is, and while it's pretty self-obvious by the by the title, um, someone in, in a big IT department might not. Nice. Um, I would say file sharing, super simple. A lot of them, um, Apple's d borrowed design elements from iOS. So you go to a service like file sharing, you, you use a on slider, and all of a sudden the, you've got a file server. Um, and that's very similar to what you can do in the sharing sysprev pane in OS X. However, it's a lot more granular in terms of what you can control. And you can uh, publish shares via WebDAV, so iOS devices can connect to them as well. And that's one of the things, I'm, I'm glad you went there for me, because I, I, I get a lot of questions about this. I, I have two Macs. I have an old Mac, and I've got files on it. And so I just set up file sharing on that, not with server, but just with file sharing. Why do I need a, a server, uh, either a dedicated machine to serve my files? Am I going to get any more performance out of it? I heard you say granular, so I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about control or access. But if I'm just going to share files wholesale, do I get any performance hit? Um, not really. The, the performance is going to be about the same. Um, the fact that you can publish um, via WebDAV, WebDAV is the native language that like Pages would use if you configure an, a server in Pages. The, the app itself um, on iOS has a, a URL field. Um, certain things like that uh, that you couldn't do with the native OS X file sharing, you would unlock that potential. 
But um, but performance like number of users speed is pretty much still going to be limited by the by the hardware in a lot of cases. So memory, bandwidth, et cetera. Um, and we do have a lot of people who take that old computer and put server on it. And that's a better server than, for example, if you used your normal everyday computer as your server because you're not borrowing resources while you're adding layers in Photoshop or using GarageBand to, to cut episodes or things of that nature. So, Yeah, I, I would think a dedicated machine is always a good idea for this. Even if it's old, yep, I completely agree with that. <clears throat> so that takes us to hardware. How even you say even if it's old, how old can I go with OS X server, and how much performance hit am I going to see the slower my machine gets? Um, I think that there's still supported 2010 machines in this. Uh, um, pretty much any machine that can run Mavericks or Yosemite can add the server app on top of it. Um, if you only have two gigs of RAM, um, then you might just want to run file sharing and let's say, um, the software update services or the caching services. Um, and you know, you, the memory typically dictates how many services you can run. So if you think about it, the server fills a certain number of roles, like a file server, a mobile device management server. Um, and you know, two gigs of RAM can typically fire up one or two services um, according to how many devices are connecting to them. Um, if you try to fire up all the services, you might need a, a solid eight gigs of RAM, even if you only have five users. So that's kind of how I typically typically look at that. Okay. <clears throat> Last thing before we get into what you cover in the book and how you cover it, and that is security. Um, we're opening, we're setting up a server, and of course that's another thing that every time you turn on the morning news or open the morning paper or whatever it is that you do in the morning, somebody, somebody's servers have been hacked. So how much exposure am I creating by installing OS X server and running it on a machine in my home and connecting it to my network where my iPhone and my iPad and my other Macs connect to? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I would say um, if you don't open access to your server from the outside world, then you're not adding any additional um, security concerns to the footprint of your home. Um, if you do start opening ports, then it would be very similar um, to what you'd be doing if you were doing the same thing with file sharing, except for you have some options to do so more intelligently. So, for example, um, file sharing on the Apple platform uses TCP port 548. You, on your firewall, open up access to that. So when you're outside of your home, you just go connect to server, you type your IP address or the name you've associated to your server, and you connect. And you hopefully have to have a username and password in the process. Um, now, each service that you add, you have to open another port or set of ports. Um, OS X server has a function for VPN. So you can just configure the VPN service, and then you're only opening one or two ports rather than opening one for each service. And the VPN doesn't, um, it, it encapsulates or encrypts the data. So instead of transferring anything um, in clear text over the wire, you're, you're in a much more secure situation. Um, so I, I would say if you do start opening your server up to the outside world, then it has a lot of features to be able to secure that, um, that opening. Uh, that you wouldn't have on a, on a normal computer. To, to keep going with this for just a second, is this something that I need to, I mean, am I going to have to be constantly patching this, or excuse me, patching, that makes it sound like it broke, um, <laughs> but updating the server, updating uh, the, the versions or whatever, or is just by the nature of once you set it up, the way you set it up, it's pretty secure? Yeah, we, we actually cover that in the book. Um, and Adam and I talked for a, a pretty good while about like the strategies that I typically employ for that. Um, I normally say always run every security update as soon as it comes out. Um, as far as the point release, the you know, um, 10.5.8, uh, 10.6.4, 10.7.4, et cetera, patches, um, th those smaller releases, I typically on a server don't run them. I just let the server run in the background. Um, when you're when you're using a server environment, and you're centralizing assets like files, 
um, you don't want to do anything to monkey with it unless it's being problematic typically. So I just like to leave it over there doing its thing, maybe let the screensaver be the clock for my office <laughs> and pretend <laughs> like it doesn't exist otherwise. So um, even though it's kind of hard for us nerds not to be always playing with something, um, when, when things become a little more mission critical, then you typically don't want to mess with it. So, yeah, I think of myself as, as a practical geek. Um, I, I, I enjoy playing with this stuff, but there, there's a point that I can't afford the time to play with it maybe as much as I want. So I want something that will do its thing. I don't mind doing a software update, but I don't have to constantly play with it. And that's so, – some people I talk to about servers, I get the impression that it's something you're going to have to really watch. And others like you just sit it in the corner, set it up right, and it will keep on going. I try to be really pragmatic with such things. Um, if, if there aren't things talking to it from the outside world, then I don't like to mess with it much. Then something like shell shock runs, comes around and you have to do stuff. Um, it becomes just an absolute requirement. And it would be that way for your, for your iMac in the background, just like it would be for, for, for a server. You know, um, For a server, I typically say run updates the same way you would on a Mac, except for maybe not as frequently because you don't want to potentially have your kids blaming the fact that you ran a software update on your server for why they couldn't get their homework turned in on time. So, (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that that would be a new note to give the teacher, wouldn't it? (laughs) (laughs) My server ate it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. and right away, Mr. Edge, we'd like to talk to you about your server skills. So let's talk about the book. How do you – because hopefully by now we've answered some basic questions and we've we've either scared people away completely and they say, no, this, I don't want to mess with this. <laughs> hopefully, though, it, it's whet their appetite for it a little bit and they think, yeah, this is something I, – I, I have a machine I'd like to play with or I'd like to try and, and I'd love to be able to administrate my kids' iPhones. Um, how, how do you introduce us to server and get us up and running? So I, I spend the first chapter talking about planning before you touch anything. Um, and, and really, there's kind of a sanity check there, like, should you be running a server? Um, and we, we do that a lot with the beginning of certain chapters as well. For example, mail, we have this huge disclaimer that's probably three paragraphs long saying, are you sure you want to do this? It's, um, mail is a very specific, difficult thing where it's potentially not socially responsible to run that service because uh, you might get it used as a spam um, service. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting emails about Viagra because you ran a mail server, not something I'm a huge fan of. Um, but, but so the first chapter, we, we do a quick, um, you know, here's, here's what it's going to take, here's what you can run this on, here's how to plan it. And then um, the second server, here's what to do on your, or the second chapter, kind of here's what to do on your network. For example, I see that airport in the background. Um, what, we, what we do is say, you know, these are the ports you might need to open up if you're going to run this service. Um, our network, from a network standpoint, here's what you might need to do to prepare for this for this box that's about to be installed. And then we go into installing um, the server app on OS 10 because really the server server is just an app now. Um, whereas in 10.6 and and below, it was uh, it wasn't an app; it was an operating system or 10.5. Um, it was an operating system, so you had to have a special disk and serial numbers and, and uh, product codes, things of that nature. Um, now we're just like, go to the app store, download the app, and open it. And, and then really trying to set the tone and take the, the lessons that we learned writing the book and the lessons that we as a community have learned over the years to, to try to keep people from making long-term problems by just willy-nilly doing stuff with the app. So do X, Y, and Z, and your life will be much better in two or three years, I promise, <laughs> type of stuff. Um, and, then, and then we go into the server on a service-by-service service basis. So at that point, it becomes uh, very much a choose-your-own-adventure book. Each chapter stands alone from then on. Um, so you can set up Profile Manager and none of the other services. Or you can just set up a caching service and nothing else and be in pretty good shape. Um, and then we, we round out the book in the end with just some basic maintenance tips. Um, and I've had servers that ran for 1,500 days without being restarted. So in some cases, no maintenance is, is great. 
And in other cases, if you don't do maintenance, then you'll have problems in 30 to 60 days. So we try to kind of help people figure out what the cadence of, of that maintenance really looks like for their use. Because um, once again, you don't want to install updates unless you kind of have to. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you, you kind of glanced over something there. I think that we all need to, we all need to understand. When, when you say server, I think a lot of us still think about the times when server meant, you know, this wall to ceiling or a floor to ceiling, excuse me, you know, hunk of big iron with, you know, blinking lights in an air conditioned room. And, you know, you, you, you had the high priestess and priests and priestesses of, of data coming in and serving the thing. And it really is, especially for Mac OS 10 server, it really is just an app that runs on on your your hardware that's that's it no different than skype or your mail program or, or anything else you're familiar with absolutely yeah and you can still buy big iron i mean if you look at pictures of the apple data center and other data centers and i spend a lot of time in data centers um i feel quite comfortable there there's all kinds of cold air blowing at me and <laughs> me sick so it's great um but you can also just have it running on a mini that's attached to your television at home um, that you only toggle over to when you need to restart it or something like that. Um, and I would say it goes even deeper than just the footprint of the box itself. Um, you know, there are three checkboxes, and, and most of the services are less. Um, so you want to set up a caching server, you literally click the on button, and that's it. You can say, oh, limit the amount of data I'm going to cache for my iOS and Mac OS X updates to 100 gigs because I don't want to fill up this hard drive. But you don't have to do that. All you have to do is click on, and all of a sudden, all the devices on your network are looking at your service for, for software updates. Um, you know, Having said that, you can still kind of grow with the product as your needs grow. Um, and I don't want to sound like a big sales pitch for OS 10 server because box is a better solution for a lot of people. Um, however, you know, it, I wouldn't be scared away by the fact that it is a server with the exception of the mail service. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I don't want all, all that junk email in my inbox. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, mail does, uh, you know, it's, it's a necessary tool. I don't think it's dying like some people say, but it is a, a bit of a pain to, to manage. In, from so many different angles. I get half as many emails these days as I used to, um, but I get twice as many instant messages and texts. <laughs> so the communication's there. Um, having said that, I cannot get my babysitter to call me back ever. She'll only text. <laughs> Uh, I, I think you're running into a generational thing there, Charles. I'm <laughs> not sure that's a tech thing. That's just generational. Yeah. Mac Voices is brought to you by Smile, the makers of lots of great software for your Mac, iPhone, and iPad. This time, though, I want to tell you about PDF Pen Scan Plus for your iPhone. There's no better time to take advantage of PDF Pen Scan Plus than the holiday shopping season. Why? Because you're going to be out and about, shopping for loved ones, attending all sorts of get-togethers and social events. You party animal, you. But where does PDF Pen Scan Plus fit in? I don't know about you, but in the midst of the rush to pick up something to share at the holiday party or trying to get that fantastic holiday deal, I always lose my receipts. Then, when I really need them to return something or keep track of what I spent on which event, I have no idea where they went. That's where PDF Pen Scan Plus comes in. Not only can you capture your receipts with a simple click of the camera button, but you can also run optical character recognition on them, turning them into searchable PDF documents. And that makes it much easier to find that receipt for that thing that you want to return when you want to return it. Want even more convenience? Sync your scans to iCloud or Dropbox. Or send them straight to Evernote or Google Docs. With PDF Pen Scan Plus, you'll never lose a receipt again. Plenty of stores are accepting these scans as proof of purchase and take the information they need to process your return right off the screen. So you don't even need to print them back out. That's convenience. That's organization. That's PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad. Only $6.99 in the App Store. Get it now and get it organized for the holidays, or for the new year, or just get organized. PDF Pen Scan Plus, one of the many great apps from Smile at smilesoftware.com. Thanks to Smile for being the longest running sponsor of Mac Voices. If you, 
if you would, uh, talk for just a second about how you address uh, media servers in the book. That seems to be a really popular thing, or if you do, uh, an iTunes server or just a, a video server for the folks that still have videos that they've ripped and, and want to store locally. Yeah, um, so we cover file services, which does include WebDAV, which is kind of like uh, file sharing uh, delivered over over the web ports. Um, and we do cover setting up a web server and um, putting files on that. However, there is no such thing as an iTunes server, really. I mean, you can go into iTunes and enable sharing. Um, but OS X Server has no ties to iTunes. Um, in fact, that doesn't seem at all like the direction that, that they're going at the moment. Um, so um, so there, there's not that much to, to really speak to there. There used to be services for um, podcast producer, uh, you know, creating video and, and putting graphics embedded in it and things of that nature, but those have long been taken out. Um, there also used to be streaming services, but those are also gone. So I, I would say, um, you know, other than just posting a video on a web page or on a file server, we, we don't really do much in that, in that space specifically. Do we typically see services come and go with versions of OS X server? That, that would intrigue me and maybe concern me a little bit if I come to depend on the server I set up and then all of a sudden I install an update and hey, guess what? It's not there anymore. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that um, a few years ago, because these were removed a few years ago, a few years ago, Apple really refactored their, their vision of this. Um, and a lot of those services really uh, revolved around QuickTime streaming. Um, QuickTime streaming is not really part of Apple's portfolio anymore at all. Um, and so we've, we've seen a lot less of that in general. Um, so I would say if you look towards the big picture with Apple, um, that's, that stuff was going away anyways, and there's still open source code out there to do it. So if you have a business model around it, you can kind of still keep going. But, um, you know, on the server ish platform, really only, only two or three services have come and gone, um, in the maybe 10 or 12 years that I've been using the product. Um, and I, I would say that the, when when QuickTime streaming disappeared, it was no surprise because I've been on the QuickTime streaming email list for for years, and it had been at least two or three years since I had gotten an email from that list. <laughs> so, <laughs> if that's any any indication, um, and uh, as far as people who have asked me, oh, what do I do now that that's gone? There's been one, um, and that service was taken out about four or five years ago. Um, but there, Apple did uh, kind of put the code in a way out in the open source community. So if you needed it, it's kind of there. So that makes sense. Um, but as far as things like file sharing, um, even profile manager, I, I wouldn't be too concerned because that's, that's definitely the future that Apple's going. And those are core services to any server. All right. so. This may sound like a, a reverse question, but is there anyone out there who shouldn't experiment with the server? I mean, you've made pretty clear about the mail thing, but um, oh. anybody that sh should just stay away from this and say, you know, no, it's just not for you? I don't think so. I, I think there are certain cases where it's it's not necessary, but I'm the type of person who's like, everyone should open Terminal and write a bash script, some point <laughs> in user experience. But I understand that, that some people just don't want like that kind of complexity. Um, I would say... That if you just um, that it becomes more of a financial dis discussion. If if it's going to run on a dedicated machine, then that's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you electricity to run all year. If you're going to keep an old machine around, eventually that machine's going to die. So it's going to need to be replaced. And so you're going to have a, a footprint of some sort. So does it make financial? Um, isn't an appropriate financial decision. Um, when you do have services like, like you mentioned, the drop boxes of the world out there. Um, and I would say, you know, you have a large graphics files and you want to edit one and have it show up on another machine. That's going to take a long time. If you don't want to wait that time, then having a file server makes sense. Um, if you do want to wait that time or, or you don't have really large files, then by all means use Dropbox and don't get a server, you know, um, I think everyone should experiment with it just because it's fun. <laughs> but having said that, um, when you actually put something into production or start using it full time and design your habits around it or your, your business's um, business logic around it, then 
then uh, the, it becomes a different kind of situation. But, um, but by all means, if Dropbox can do what you need, if iCloud accounts can do what you need as far as calendaring, there's no reason to run a calendar server. Um, if Google Apps can do what you need, then definitely don't run a mail server. Not that I want to dwell on this whole spam thing. I might have deleted 20 from my inbox before this. Um, <laughs> so it's fresh on the mind. But, um, but you know, across the board, I, I would say uh, if there's something out there that can do what, a task that you need to do, and even if it costs you a minimal amount of money, uh, that might be cheaper than just the electricity bill of running a server. So, um, so by all means, everyone should play with it. Everyone should, you know, re read the articles that we did on tidbits and, and see how easy it is to use. And if they have a place where it makes sense in their life, definitely leverage it. Um, if only as a caching server, because when those big updates come out, it takes forever to download and that caching server makes it faster for all those devices. And it makes it faster for the rest of the world. It's socially responsible because you're not clogging at Apple's internet bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> which is yeah which is kind of important no, yeah. fact, no question about that you know you, you again you said something that made me rethink an earlier question i i asked you about the security of mm -hmm. of this but th there is something to be said for having this the server under your control not picking on dropbox but you know there are issues with anybody who's putting files up in the cloud on one of those services. The odds are that it's never going to be a problem, but there's still that small percentage chance. By setting up a server like this, are we decreasing that chance or eliminating that, that chance since we are theoretically in control of our files? I would say that any service is only as good as the password used on that service. So if your Dropbox password is long and strong, then, uh, then your account should be very, very secure. Um, if you don't open any access to the outside world to your server and it's just in that walled garden that's your home network, then it would actually be a little more secure than Dropbox with the exception of backups. Um, so let's say that you're using CrashPlan or Time Machine. Um, you know, you don't have to back up your Dropbox. It's backed up by Dropbox. Um, so I, I definitely look at security um, including backups always. So as long as you're backing up, then I would, and you have an open ports, then I would say absolutely it's more secure. Um, having said that, if you're not backing it up or if you're not checking on the backups regularly, um, you know there are whole teams of people at Dropbox and Box and Google App or Google Drive um, that are that are checking um, the health of those backups and doing things like that. So. As long as you're doing that, then great, you know, and it, and it's more secure. And if you're not, then the data might not be as secure as it would be in Dropbox. So, and I keep using Dropbox as an example. But, sure, you know, sure. And, to, and and call me paranoid, but you know, the fact that there are a, a dozen people on those teams working, you know, mean that there are theoretically a dozen people that have access to something that maybe. In theory, you might not want. Now, I know there are a lot of corporate protections and a lot of procedural protections and encoding and, and all kind of things. But at the same time, there's something that still just feels good about, okay, I've got this file and I'm putting it on that box over there in the corner of my office and that's the only place it's going to live and I'm watching it. So, Yeah. Um, I, I can give you an example of something like that. Not that, uh, not that I'm trying to tell people not to use OS X servers, so this might not be the best thing to say. <laughs> But um, so so I at my job, um, you know, there's there's some uh, SaaS type products going on, um, and you know, we who write code don't have access to production data, um, and the people who have access to production data bases don't have access to production data. So it takes two of three people in a lot of cases to actually access something. Um, so, um, when we're putting controls in place, no single human can go from within the code to production data, um, as, as a straight line without involving a second party, if that makes sense. And yes, you know, you can have multiple people be involved in things, but that's super rare. And, um, and there, there are protections like background checks about stuff like that as well. Um, anytime you've got large scale hosted services, so you know. And I, I've known a lot of the people at companies like Dropbox and Box, and 
um, there, there's oftentimes some, some person that just is lording over that and making sure that it's not possible for anything bad to happen. And then there's someone lording over them. <laughs> and then there's a company <laughs> like, uh, like my former employer, Accenture, lording over them doing like Sarbanes-Oxley audits, making sure that all these best practices are in place. So, you know, the, the idea that, uh, I mean, I have yet to hear about a data breach from the inside, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm sure it'll happen. Yeah. But, um, but I like to think that as long as we're all doing things the right way, that, that that's going to be difficult. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm not, I don't mean to disparage anybody's service, you know, I, I, I cause I'm like you, I have, I hear about this, the, the breaches, but I never really hear about any serious effect from them. Now I'm, I know there are people out there that have serious effects. Um, and the data breaches from the inside, yeah, are, are pretty much unheard of. So I, I guess I'm speaking more from a common sense standpoint. Um, yep. Because, you know, it, hey, the box is sitting in my office. Somebody can walk in my office and take my box. And I've seen that happen. Yeah. So, um, you know. Luckily, both times that I saw that happen, they were using CrashPlan to back up the server. So they had a copy of all the data offsite. Yeah. Um, not that this is an ad for crash plan, but <laughs> no, but I, well, I use crash plan too, full disclosure. So I'm right there with you. You know, that that's, you're right. Um, so the security thing, you know, security is just depends on how you handle it. No, no question. Absolutely. So this seems like your approach that as published in tidbits and as published in take control of OS 10 server seems pretty Bulletproof. It seems to walk me through, hold me by the hand, give me lots of screenshots so that I know what I'm clicking where and what the implications are. It feels like something I probably would want to take on because of your guidance. Thanks. Um, or thanks on Adam's behalf. That has nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> oh. And Tanya. Um, yeah, I mean, we really tried to take the approach of starting, and this is the reason I, I had actually said I wasn't going to write any more books before I, before I told Adam yes on this one. Um, the reason that I, I kind of approached this project in the first place was because it was a very interesting demographic, um, because of the changes in my life outside of, of this book. Um, and, and so I'm looking at, at this project and I'm thinking, you know, the more exposure I can have to to a less IT focused or IT centric audience, the better. Um, you know, I, I used to have way too many people that said move and shove people out of the way to work on their computers in my <laughs> life. And it's so much better now or something like that. Um, but, but you know, the, that, that, that entire user experience, I would say, is why I actually embarked upon this. And really, I couldn't have done this project three or four years ago because it hadn't gotten that simple. You know, Apple went through, much to the chagrin of many old-school IT admins, and refactored the look and feel of server and said, you know, we can just make this a slider button, and then it'll look more like iOS. We can take out the eight fields that people never use that are confusing just give people two checkboxes that tell them exactly what they're going to do. And if they still need those other features, they can go into the command line and do them. But, um, but if only 10% of the people out there are using them, then why, why are we complicating it for the other 90%? So I, I'm definite congratulations to the server team for going as far as they've gone in the development of this product. But then also huge congratulations to Adam for explaining to me what, what normal humans... Uh, <laughs> understood and didn't understand as far as this thing goes so uh, charles, <clears throat> charles you keep feeding me things i've, I've got to ask you um as, as a, a card carrying server geek does that simplified approach uh or i guess that's the best word simplified is that does that bother you do you feel like that is it obviously make it makes it more approachable for the rest of us but do you feel that it's taking away power or is it just relegating the power of those eight settings into the terminal where somebody like you can access them and I never have to see them so they don't scare me or I can't screw them up. What, what they've done is they've made it, um, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, they've made it easier to do the things that needed to be easier and they've made it harder to do the things that maybe didn't need to be harder but are. Um, and, and that's a, that's a trade-off that I'm willing to pay, um, especially since people would have to hire me to make those hard things <laughs> work. But, um, but that's a trade-off that I think we're, most of us are very willing to pay simply because, um, or make simply because 
it, it exposes a wider audience to getting started with the product and, and means that the product will continue on. Um, sales of the product have skyrocketed since they've refactored things in this way. And so it, it speaks to the long-term viability of the career path that many of us chose. Um, as a side, it also made me be like, oh, I should not be a server guy anymore <laughs> and switch jobs. <laughs> So there's that. <laughs> and then when that happens, you write another book and come back and talk to us about it. I know, right? <laughs> How's that? <laughs> uh, we'll see about that. I am I'm, uh, I, I love writing. I, I don't know if I have any more books in me, but we'll see. I keep saying that, and I, I think I've been saying that for four books now. So <laughs> I have a problem saying no. It's like fear of missing out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we all suffer from that. Right. You know, the way I think, too, we, we've talked about the, the old hardware that it can run on. Server now is not expensive. At one time, I think it, it pretty much was. But now, is it, am I wrong? Is it like $30, $40? 20 dollars So it started out yeah. as $1,000. Yeah. Um, and and it has, as, as they've simplified it, they've also simplified the pricing model. So, for example, it used to be $1,000 for unlimited users and a different price point for, um, I think, 1 to 10 or something like that. Um, so, you know, one SKU now, and, and really it's not even a SKU because it's on the App Store. Um, so it, it's no longer its own operating system. It's no longer um, expensive. It's now super cheap. Um, and it still does almost all the same stuff it did, minus a couple services that people really weren't using. So, um, and it's super easy to use, and I, I think a lot more people can kind of take use of it. In the future, I'd love to see that iTunes server element be introduced. I think everyone wants that. Even server admins want that, because we all have iTunes too. <laughs> um, so if I could make one shout out to the product management team at Apple, it would be, hey, iTunes server would be great. <laughs> it might be something that compels people to take up server and use it. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, having said that, you know, it's it's always hard to understand what the exact target market is for for any product, um, uh, and you know if you go back to Guy Kawasakiisms, it's hard to understand that yourself sometimes when you're building products. So, yeah. so <clears throat> the server it's server software itself is twenty bucks. How much is is this book? Do we know? Because right now we're hey. recording this a little ahead of time, so. Yeah, I actually don't know. I would have to ask Adam. I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> no, it, I mean we we often do these just a little ahead of time, but but usually take control books are in the in the fifteen ten to fifteen dollar range, um, so and there are always bundles and discounts that can be taken. So really, for for a lot less than uh, probably fifty bucks, I mean you can get into this, experiment with it, get more control of some of the things in your life, and just have a good time learning a little more about what makes your your Mac tick. I'm, yeah, I think it's a deal. Thanks. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I do. So, take control of OS 10 Server by Charles Edge. Charles, thank you so much for being here. This is great. We have to do it again. So, whether you write another book or not, we got to have you back and uh, tell us a little more. I'd I'd love to be back. Um, so, keep me in mind if you ever have any really nerdy topics you want to delve into. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. You're on the list. You're All on right. the list. Um, hey, last thing before we forget, do you have a website, blog, Twitter account that you uh, want to promote where people can connect with you? Sure. Um, website is uh, cryptid.com, K-R-Y-P-T-E-D dot C-O-M. And my Twitter account is C-Edge, C-E-D-G-E, 318. Perfect. Perfect. So go out and uh, get all kind of nerdy goodness from Charles. Get Take control of OS X server and start playing with it. Charles, awesome. we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Chuck. Can't wait. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices, the talk of the Mac community. We'll be back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. 
bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.